Hello, anybody there? Hello, hello.
Hey there, uh, Tamara, are you there? Anybody hear me? Hi, y'all. Anybody there? Can I, you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Tamara. How you doing? Good. I don't think we're plugged into the meeting. I texted Joey to see if there was anything he could do about it. Oh, okay. I've been trying to call Haley and uh, she doesn't answer. So I'm not sure what's going on. Well, he said he would check into it. I'm, you know, is, I don't know. I'm not sure what they're doing. Is Joey over there? Yes, he is. Oh, okay, good. So, so the hearing started. We just can't hear it. We're not seeing anything. Do you, do you know who Eric Hardy is? No. Or Jennifer Brooks? No relation to me that I know oh, of. Oh, I, I assumed she was with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, I, well. I don't know who she is. I think we have a Jennifer in the family, but I don't think that's uh -huh. her. <laughs> <laughs> so I, well, I don't know if there's another link and we just, we have like the bogus link or what? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I got an email from Cynthia Arrowwood, who's Brian Golden's uh, assistant. Yeah, and that's the one I used. And then Haley said it wasn't working and they were going to send me a new link, but they never did. Well, I got an email from Cynthia and I'm not sure. I, I think it went to Joey. It didn't go to you. Right. Joey forwarded it to me and that's what I used. Yeah, it said it's working. It should be working anyway. Should, should And that's the one you clicked on? That's the one I clicked on. So here we are. But uh, well, it's not, I, don't, obviously I don't know not how to get into that. that good. Yeah. You know, I don't know how to yeah. get into that meeting. Maybe they're all done and they just approved it and we're all set. You know, that would be fine with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> me too. So uh, anyhow, I don't know what to do. I, uh, I guess we can try try to call well uh are you able to get a hold of joey and find out well let me just look at my phone and see if he's if he's answered my text oh okay he said gotcha i'll see what i can do okay so, so they know that we're sitting here yeah they, they know we're sitting here on this meeting now so I don't know what else to do, to be honest. I don't know where we're, we're supposed to be, I guess. So it's up to them, I guess, to connect us, right? Or call us up on the phone and say, you know, I mean, we could, I can speak on the phone if they have a speaker phone there or something. You okay, know. let me just say that. Bennett is willing to speak on a speaker phone if this link is not working. Just let me know. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I just sent that to him. So how are you doing? Yeah, I, I'm doing fine, I'm in Florida and I don't go to North Carolina until um, Wednesday. And I had told her I could move my flight, but I'm so busy down here with building inspections because that building collapsed, you know? Yeah. And so everybody wants to get a 40 year like yesterday. Yeah, I know. And uh, I have like sixty thousand dollars worth of inspections to do in the next two months. Wow. Are are you doing those, or are you hire an yeah. engineer? You well, doing... you can be either a licensed architect or engineer. Oh, okay. Um, he says send a message through Zoom. Okay, let me see what my options are to send a message. Well, we've Participants. Got... We've got chat. If it's allowed, they have a tech watching. Okay. So Zoom, and it says, I'm looking at my options, and it says participants. We are not in the meeting. Yeah. So she's saying we are not in the meeting. Uh, okay. Well, that's true. Does she work for the city, I wonder? I don't know. Oh, she's coming on. Oh, hi. hi. I'm, hi. I'm Jennifer. I'm Haley's friend. So I'm just here to he see the the end the end part. But I know. Well, uh, you can't. I you could hear us. We're trying to figure out to send them a message 
so that we can get connected to the meeting. Um, I've not messaged people on Zoom, but who, the host is this Eric Hardy, right? So I believe so. He's the I one. So we could try to raise our hand. I can do that. Switch and to. Someone, someone recorded the meeting. That's right. Him. Yes, Jennifer, Tamara, I can see each other. Okay. Okay. Well, I guess you know that we can't, we're not in the meeting. I see Bill Hill has just popped up. Hi, Jennifer. This is Bennett. I don't know if we're related, but uh, howdy. <laughs> Hi. Hello. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I guess I'll keep myself muted here uh, unless you, uh, I am needed. Okay, well, I'm just trying to figure out how we can message them to let them know that. Well, well I got a message from Eric Hardy. If you look in the, if you click on the chat box below, yeah, um, it says, he said, can you two hear each other talking? And I said, yes. So he's trying to troubleshoot it. I guess so. Okay. Well, I think if you hit the little down button on Zoom, you can chat. No, that doesn't work. Yeah, down below all the faces, if you've got a picture, you know, picture of all the, everybody, there's a, a little bubble will patch up, pick up that says chat. Okay, I'm looking for that. Just kind of scroll around down there and you'll see chat and it should. Raise up. hand. Okay, I raised my hand. <laughs> well, raise hand's good too, I'll do that. Okay. <laughs> And then to the left of that, it says chat, so we can chat with each other. <laughs> yeah. And uh, somehow we're not in with the town right now. I don't know who Eric Hardy is. I think he, he must be, be somebody who works for the town. But he did he did uh, send a, a message on the chat from Eric Hardy to everyone. And, and what does his message say? His message says, can you two hear each other talking? And you answered him? I answered yes. All right, again, we can you, can hear, you hear me? Oh, yes. hi. Let me handle this, please. Can you, hear, can you hear me? That's Eric, right? Is that Eric? Yes. Yes. Hi, Eric. And now hey, we can, can hear. We can hear. To the meeting? I'm sorry. Can you connect us to the meeting? This one here. So Ryan, what is the what is the answer to that question? Can we connect them to the meeting? Not Facebook Live. Look in the chat, and there's a there's a link in the chat. Is that what you said? They're in the meeting. They're they're in this meeting. I think they want to see. There's so are you broadcasting anywhere so they can see? We can see them, but they cannot see us. I think is what they're saying. Uh, and so, well, what if I do this? No, we're gonna have to. There and, you go. I just saw you. Well, yes. Give, give us just a second. You're not going to see what you want to see, I'm afraid. <laughs> and this, this is one laptop. So what do you want to look at? Oh, okay. All right. Well, as long as we can hear what's going on, that's great. Yes. I see Haley. Hi, Haley. Hi. We've been sitting here for about a half hour waiting to see if the meeting was going to start. We've been watching. <laughs> So if you guys will mute each of you until you're called, right? Is that yes? Hold on, we can't hear Haley. I, th I think you need to unmute, Eric. Hello? 
<laughs> and then um, the next question is some some facilities have uh, like live cameras where people can check in. Is that going to be incorporated into yours as well? So the, all the places will have live cameras where anybody who has their data is on there, they can check in. So, um, each luxury suite will have a private camera for only the owner to check in. And then the other suite will have a rolling camera so that we can look in, but it won't be individualized. Uh, but of course, I and the manager will always be able to watch it right, all the yeah, time as an overnight person. So, I don't know if I can ask you this or not, but. Nevertheless, since I have several dogs and all of us have dogs, how much are is it going to cost someone to stay? I mean, more or less. You know, I mean, obviously it's going to be different for the superior and other suites, but just a bit here. You know, like if I had my dog and I was going to go somewhere for the, the day and I wanted to drop my dog off for doggy daycare. How much? How much Right. So the depending on the program that you choose or that your dog qualifies for, like yeah. if your dog can play with a bunch of other dogs, right. then of course the you know staff to dog ratio is, is not as much. When if your dog only <coughs> can play with one staff and it's a size full here. And then if it's just a small group like maybe two or three other dogs up to six, then that price of course is different too. So what of um, Western North Carolina, all everybody in Bunkum County right now, they've Almost every single one of them only has what they call large group play. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them have up to 30 dogs in those. That, that won't happen at my place um, because I believe in the individualized plan. So the, the bigger the group, um, it'll be in line with the rest of Buncombe County, around okay. $32. Okay. Okay. There are some facilities that are, you know, that don't have as big of play zones and things like that. But then, of course, it can go to 50, depending on, you know, what is required of your individual life. Okay, just one other question. 170 spaces, 14 people. Yep. Is that enough? So that, I, I think at Christmas time, it also depends on what level of service you can offer. So um, it could, if everyone there is one on one, then I, I do think that that would, cha that would change greatly. Right, right. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> With that being in mind, we might have to, um, if I'm that full and everyone's one-on-one, yeah, on one, exactly. I would probably have to turn people away because I wouldn't even have the staff trained in order to right. do all one-on-one. -on -one. So um, I do have consultants um, that actually have two facilities in, um, they have two locations in the Charlotte area, one in Charlotte proper, and then one in Pineville. They have worked with me from the beginning up. Um, I actually found them through the Small Business Administration Told the Small Business Administration my idea and said that I couldn't find anywhere that had this business plan, this model of my daycare, because it's a specialized program. And um, Bill Hill is who is one of the consultants, one of the owners, said he was just an emerging leader. He was at the conference and they set me up with him. And it was the first time that it was like an aha moment because we had the same idea of what dogs need and what was the best for them emotionally. Mm -hmm. You know when when the parents are away, and you know what was best for the staff members and clients and dogs. So they have helped me design the program in order to accommodate with the numbers. Too many for all the research. Thank you. Please call uh, Michael Goldberg. Yeah, if you just introduce yourself to the to the board, tell them a little bit about your education and training. Hi folks, my name is Michael Goforth. I'm a licensed civil engineer by the state of North Carolina. I have my firm in town. It's called High Country Engineering. Um, I've been in business since 2009. I've been practicing engineering in the state of North Carolina since about 20 or 2006. <laughs> In this area, West North Carolina, about that time. Um, my education is from 
dangerous thing in the bid, but it's from Clemson University. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, and see you better No, if you want to write, I realized what I was walking into as soon as I went down. Um, but I went to school at Clemson. I have a master's degree in environmental engineering and science. And um, I've done a lot of, a wide variety of projects across Western North Carolina from um, commercial development such as this, residential site design, uh, subdivisions to heavy utilities for several municipalities in the area across Western North Carolina. Um, concrete water storage tanks, water treatment systems, wastewater treatment systems, things of that nature. The essence of my experience. In preparation for today's hearing, did you uh, draft up an affidavit which uh, includes uh, your CV and uh, an amendment to the site plan? Yes, I did. And I'm just going to hand you what I've marked as exhibit three. It's exhibit, it's behind tab three. Is that your affidavit? That's correct. All right. And what we'll do is I'll just, yeah, I'll just ask you to kind of generally walk through if you want to come up here, if you can come up here and talk about the, the plan. I will, um, I'll, I'll just walk you through the plans and uh, y'all are free to ask me questions as you go along. Um, so this is the existing conditions of the site. There's not much on it right now. There is one one mobile home and a block storage building uh garage set building but both of those will be demolished and removed off the site um and then we can sort of see overall what we've got going on here now um you can see the main building here takes up uh the, the majority of the site the building is roughly 90 by 172, somewhere in that range. Um, and so that, that's the main footprint of the building there. All these areas on the outside are um, play zones, as Haley's described for you, for different needs, for different purposes. Um, this is the porch here to drive under and park. There'll be um, parking spaces along the front there as well. Um, there is staff parking over here. And of course, staff can park where they need to, but this is primarily going to be staff parking with a fence sort of surrounding it, as we, as Haley described. This is her private, this is a single family residence that's up here at the top of the hill. Um, and so we've got a one way entrance off of Weaverville Highway here, and then it'll loop around, everything will loop around to one one way exit onto Weaverville Highway. Um, that is the, the essence of the site plan. <clears throat> pretty standard parking. Um, we've got, you know, a pretty standard 24 foot drive out, except where we have angled parking a little bit less you know, it's sort of easier to get down. Um, can you talk a little bit just about the uh, utilities uh, and any buffers <laughs> that are shown on that site plan? Yeah. Plan, which is on the next page here. Um, the building will be sprinkled, so that's a uh, that's a good thing for fire prevention and fire department access. Um, we will be tapping the line that's out here on Weaverville Road, and all permits necessary to do that. We will be placing it's called a high flow preventer to. Protect the public water supply, pretty standard on a commercial operation like this. Two of them, one for the fire line, one for the message. Um, metering the water, installing a new hydrant, fire hydrant out front. Um, it's suited for the building, but it's obviously going to be turned over to public use for at least by the Woodson Sanitary District or Woodson Water District. Now. The one change that may be on the printed plan that you may have. Is there is two pump stations um, to connect out to MSD sewer. Each building will have its own pump station um, that then will be used across. Yes. But the pump stations for the sewer, is that necessary yeah. for the size or the, the use of the property? Would, would a regular office building have one? No. Um, What's yours? <laughs> <laughs> you got a cord down here and I got a TV up here. 
I'm um, curious. No, that's that's a fair question. The reason the pump stations are required is because there is no gravity sewer access in proximity to this site. So old on the other side of the church here, the name of the road there, I'm blanking on old home road, sort of the top of the hill. Yeah, that's right. And so there is no gravity sewer access to this part of um, from here all the way down to where the a go kart track is, for lack of a better word, there. Like the putt putt place and the go kart track. There's no gravity sewer. So we have to pump. Um, and the reason there's two pump stations is because this was guidance we got from Kevin Johnson at MSD was that um, if we put both buildings into one pump station, then we have what's considered a collection system, which has to have its own separate permit from the state of North Carolina. So that's something we, we don't want to do. That's a lot more paperwork and work to keep up with. So we're going to have two separate pump stations and two separate pump lines going out and tapping into uh, the line, MSD's public line out there in this old home run. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, one other question. Yes. Uh, I'm not seeing topographic lines on all of these. Is this... That's the next one. Okay, sorry. That's the, the grading and stormwater plan on the next page. Yeah, thank you. Um, but while I'm on this, well, I'll go on to the next one. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You're going to talk about uh, maybe landscape stormwater. Well, as with most places in Western North Carolina that are left undeveloped, there's a lot of topography. There's, there's some topography to deal with. Um, so, in order to put this building on here, we will have uh, three retaining walls. There's one down here on the southern boundary, one along here on the northern, and then another one along here on the northern boundary um, with ABCPM there. This one's sort of interior to the site. I don't think folks will really notice it. Um, but yes, there are several retaining walls, and the grade is um, once required there to get both of these things in here, both of these buildings in here. Um, all the storm water for the site will come around and be collected down here in this in this um, underground detention system. It'll be required. It'll be a Buncombe County stormwater permit. We will apply for you. to get that permit. Um, we'll abide by all the requirements. Treatment of the first one into range. Um, capture of the one in the ten year storm. So um, that'll be underground and storm tech chambers that you may have seen at other construction sites, big, big yellow chambers that they have out there on the site, usually bury them, they wrap them in stone. There's a mechanism to keep them clean, um, built into them the way they do it, and to clean out only the first rows so that it can accommodate some of that. Um, erosion control, we will definitely have more than an acre of disturbance to do this. We'll get a erosion control permit from Washington County again on that. Um, and we will likely, I mean, I, I didn't prepare, I can kind of think on what a typical erosion control plan will look like. We'll have silt fence surrounding the site. We'll have construction entrances, keep the mud out of the street, do those things. Be good neighbors, keep the mud off the neighbors. So that, and even like on the low area, you, you end up having almost a double row of silt fence there to protect you. The downstream neighbors a little bit more. Um, so that's the plan for the erosion control. And then lastly is sort of the the minimum requirements. At least when the sort of landscape plan in the buffer, the fix that Haley has proposed to take care of um, it, it, it reduces the buffer width that's required. And um, we'll have that surrounding the site, and then we'll have some landscaping. Um, certainly not all of it, but we'll have parking lot landscaping down here, some buffer landscaping up against the church where there is no fence, and uh, some bigger pine trees along the back. So you're going to use the six and eight foot fence for the screening. That's correct. Did you talk to uh, the fire marshal about? Uh, I guess fire safety or health safety issues and uh, are the roads wide enough to accommodate? Yes. 
Thanks. Um, I met with fire marshal on site. Um, I have the exact date. I don't remember exactly when. Um, and we just we looked at the site. We discussed the adequacy of the access, um, the drive aisles, the width, the height of the porta chair over the overhang, and everything. He was generally fine with everything. Of course, as we go through the process, we refine the plans. We'll be going back to him to get final approval on the plans and to have um, his blessing on the plan. So, in, in your opinion, the proposed facility is built according to those plans. Um, will it have any detrimental effect on the health, safety, welfare, the comfort of people residing in that neighborhood? No, it'll look like a commercial development for all um, for all extents and purposes from the street. Um, it'll look like a nice building. I don't have a standard parking lot, things like that. It'll go with most commercial development you would see up and down Weaverville Highway. And in, in your opinion, will the proposed use is allowed to go forward with the normal and development of any other improvements in that area? No, nope. we're strictly actually utilizing our pro the property that's been proposed. And um, you know, the ABCCM and the or we're we won't be affecting your development, your building the result of doing the uh, in your opinion, are there adequate uh, utilities, access roads, drainage, and other necessary facilities for the development of the um, proposed mm -hmm. use? Definitely. And um, are, in your opinion, have adequate measures or will adequate measures be taken to provide appropriate ingress and egress and staffing the vehicles so that there's uh, no vehicles uh, again, waiting, yes. queuing uh, in a meter building? Yes, we have. Um... <laughs> We've sent this plan to Nick Dorado with the DOT for a kind of quicker review of a driveway permit. And he gave us some feedback, a couple of small critiques to the plans that we can work out as we go. Um, and then obviously we'll have to submit for a full driveway permit to get it to obtain approval and our connections and everything back out to the And also as part of the group development that's proposed, you had uh, submitted some information related to the, the general requirements, the uh, land and landscaping, recreation, open space plan, structure and utility systems plan, uh, street parking and loading, stormwater drainage, as built, in your opinion, does um, this facility satisfy all of those group development specific requirements that you uh, assisted in uh, filling out and compiling for the application? On page four, five, and six. Yes. Those would be my questions for Mr. Gilbert. Excuse me, the board has any more questions. Do you have any more questions for me? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, put it back to the front. Uh, we've called Joey Burnett. Afternoon. My name is Joey Brennan. I'm the project manager for this particular uh, project. Um, I work with the Tamara Peacock on the Architects. Uh, Tamara is actually on the call right now, but she is currently in our Florida office. Um, I run the, the Hendersonville office up here. Um, so, like I said, our office is in Hendersonville. I'm not too far down the mountain from you guys, but uh, I've been working there for about five years now. Uh, Tamara's been there for over 12, I believe, um, and doing architecture for over 30 plus years. So, uh, she's quite the um the architect to kind of work under so uh tell, but, yeah, tell the board you're talking about me uh architect working under uh miss peacock can you tell the board a little bit about your education and training absolutely yeah so i received my degree from uh UC charlotte so they've never had a football team at this point or <laughs> anything like that so uh, <laughs> a little years ago um so yeah i have a bachelor of arts and architecture and uh another degree and digital art from them. Um, and I'm currently working on licensure uh, in that department. But uh, that was um, in 2013. So I've been doing architecture, uh, like I said, for about five years. And are you familiar with the project that's before this board for a uh, special use permit? Uh, very intimately. I've been working with Haley for about three years now on this project. Um, this is uh, an iteration of it. So uh, I've 
uh, I know this building pretty much inside and out. And uh, as um, part of your preparation for today's hearing, uh, did you uh, submit or did you draft up an affidavit uh, which includes your CV and your opinion uh, of this use meeting certain standards of the town of Lipton? I did. And I'm going to show you what has been marked as exhibit four. Is that your affidavit? That's correct. Now, you didn't, it wasn't um, uh, attested to as kind of a knowing recovery, but uh, you attest to the board that this is your signature and this is the yes, affidavit. That's correct. Uh, and that is also behind tab four in the board's notebook. Um, let me just ask you briefly you're the project manager on a working tour license. Uh, Tamara Peacock, does she have the license? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you submitted as part of the application the architectural plans, which are uh, a, starting on page 17 of the application as exhibit A. Yes. Uh, can you run through that a little bit and talk about uh, some of the design facilities and safety measures? Absolutely. So um, this building is roughly about 15,000 square feet. Um, it is uh, currently um, being designed as a block building. So we'll have eight inch block uh, split face CMU. So you have a nice uh, textured exterior. Um, where we differ a little bit is going to be at the front facade. Um, we are going to like we're going to have that wooden uh, uh, covering. Um, we're going to have uh, local stone kind of wrapping up a little bit with some, some nice planters. It's a way of taking what is uh, a larger building and kind of breaking it down to a more human scale. And that's where you're going to be interacting with the building. It's going to be at the front, uh, so you have um, a little bit more of a welcoming experience. Um, the rest of the building is for the docks. So we have um, over 100 suites. The luxury suites, I believe they're eight by eight. They're um, with their own individual uh, outdoor run. Uh, the outdoor runs are connected uh, with an overhead door so that we can kind of control the height. Um, so we're not just letting, uh, we're not swinging that door up eight feet if you have a uh, 15 pound or eight. Um, so we kind of adjust a little bit there. Um, and also raise it if uh, humans need to uh, access the, the yards. Um, we have um, all the support structures you need. Uh, there's a fully staffed kitchen for the dogs. The humans get a smaller break room. The, uh, there's a full grooming, there's training, conference, office space, uh, plenty of storage, uh, bathrooms. So there's a small retail shop, uh, and then everything else is for the dogs. Um, and, and, and the plans that I can yes. hand it up to you in the, in the application, are there ADA, uh, the Americans with Disability Act standards that apply to the development of the Oh, project? absolutely, yeah. So we have full accessibility uh, from the lower lot. Uh, there'll be a nice ramp that takes you up into the covering. Um, there's also uh, loading zones um, up on the building level, uh, so you can drop your dog off uh, without actually having to exit the car uh, and someone can take the dog from you at that point. Um, but there is a full accessibility from the lower lot all the way to the building. There's full accessibility in the bathrooms, um, in the kitchen spaces, um, so you don't have to be, uh, the reception space, uh, it's all designed to allow for um, uh, ADA access for employees and guests. So, And we also heard about uh, the building being sprinkled. Correct. Um, is there also uh, appropriate exits for staff members on the off chance that something were to happen? Absolutely, yeah. This building is over designed to be safe. Um, the strength, uh, like I said, there's the wall, the non combustible uh, block. Um, they have uh, the building is completely sprinklered. The, uh, their uh, additional exits then required by code. Um, this is to help uh, in the off chance if there is something that goes wrong. We have the sprinklers by our time. And the exits allow for easier access to get animals and uh, mm -hmm. personal health. So um, you, you talked about the, the walls being a tin block. What's the importance of that? Uh, it's twofold. Uh, there is a, um, like I said, they're non combustible material. So there's added life safety value to it. Uh, they're also a fairly thick and dense material uh, with an air cavity inside to prevent the transmission of uh, sounds. Is there also, is that facility also designed with uh, acoustical ceiling tiles? Correct, yes. Uh, everything has, the uh, building will have full acoustical ceiling tiles. We have also designated certain walls to go up to the roof deck 
uh, to further kind of transmission of sound. Um, so if you're a guest, uh, you're not walking and you're walking through the halls on the tour, you're not hearing um, the, the sound will be kind of uh, cornered off into different sections. Is there any yeah. other? Oh, if you can just describe for the board the aesthetics yeah, uh, from the outside of the facility, which is again in, contained in Exhibit A. Absolutely. So, like Haley mentioned earlier, she wanted this to be a barn. Um, the roof line um, is a simple gable. We have canopies that overhang on the outside play zones. Um, and so, there are slower, a lower pitch, so you kind of get that traditional barn. Uh, profile from the street. Um, and then, like I said, the entrance where the humans are going to kind of, or, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I've been thinking dogs and humans this yeah. entire project. Where most of the guests are going to be uh, interacting with the building is going to be uh, a timber construction. Uh, you're going to be able to get that kind of uh, West North Carolina feel through the materials that are going to be locally sourced. Um, and it's going to um, give you a very, uh, mountain texture as you walk through. Um, the rest of the building is built to be durable. It's built to laugh, it's built to have dogs do what dogs do. Um, and so, um, I mean, between the fencing and the block, this thing will be up there for as long as you will have it. So. Uh, in your opinion, the, the use, if it's, it's allowed to go forward, um, Will it have any detrimental effect or endanger any public health, safety, welfare, morals of people working at the facility and or working or residing in close proximity to the facility? Uh, it should not. It's um, it's a very well. Uh, Haley's put a ton of research into this project, and she's uh, cut no. She's took spared no expense to make sure this building is uh, comfortable for everybody and everybody, anybody and everybody. So. And, and in your opinion, does the architectural style fit in with the surrounding community and or Western North Carolina in general? Absolutely. Uh, I've been, like I said, I've been designing buildings here for uh, a number of years and uh, the materials here are very typical of construction in the area. Um, and the uh, material palette is the same. So it's uh, a little bit right. And, and the lighting, um, we submitted a, a lighting plan. Is that going to be uh, architecturally appropriate with the surrounding communities and in West North Carolina in general? Absolutely, yes. We have a, uh, a electrical engineer on the project who has um, thoroughly vetted the, the, or the, or the lightings uh, that will be used on the site to keep things uh, site specific and it won't bleed over to your neighbors. It's not going to bleed up into the sky. On the beautiful uh, starry skies that we get, um, it's uh, but it will be sufficient for the safety of guests and staff. So, is it your opinion that adequate measures have been taken uh, to minimize any light trespass or glare associated with the proposed use of the lab go forward? Absolutely. Those would be my questions for Mr. Burnett. Unless the board has any more questions. Um, yeah, one question. Yes. Where did overall the facility itself? When you go to very little to the store and store facility, I guess we just want to go there at this time. But I would imagine there's quite a bit of storage you need to get yes. a facility like that. Yeah, so we have thought so. Um, uh, most of the food and medicines and stuff like that are actually going to be stored in the kitchen. Um, so you'll see um, in the kitchen, there's a whole wall to the north that's going to be cubbing. Um, these will be um, from floor to ceiling high, uh, and they'll, uh, I believe they'll be uh, labeled for room. And so, and then there's also a pantry to the south that has a similar storage system there. So um, we also have storage uh, just north of the, um, the toilets. Uh, and that's going to be more of your administrative uh, operational type of storage. Um, there's the out, um, there is some cubbies in the lobby that are going to be for outgoing dogs. And so when you come to pick up your dog, their food and medicine and toys and stuff like that will be in a cubby ready for you to grab it and go. 
Uh, we have additional storage um, in, uh, so we have two cleaning closets, um, and then we also have uh, another storage suite off the side for if it's uh, miscellaneous pen uh, overflow panels or anything like that. Um, so we have tried, there is also going to be um, a mechanical mezzanine above the admin space. So that's where our uh, heavy uh, mechanical units are going to go. That's kind of where the main infrastructure for the training systems are going to go. Um, I'm sure there's also going to be some uh, overstock light bulbs and stuff like that get stored up there. So. so just like the storage department, we'll be talking about the system wide library system. It actually has the, the system message like stream through so that you can't mess up on how much is for, for gallon of water and whatnot. So there won't really be like dozens of cleaning supplies hanging around anywhere because of this um, clean wide uh, multi system. And specifically, you're talking about Haley uh, and Mr. Bennett, uh, is Exhibit G in the application? Correct. Uh, any other questions from the board members? Thank you so much. Our next witness, and we thank the board uh, for allowing Mr. Bennett Brooks to testify remotely. Howdy, folks. I don't know. Uh, can everybody hear me and see me? I don't know where to turn it up from. This or this. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. How's everybody doing tonight? Thank you for uh, having me uh, to your meeting and, and allowing the Zoom presentation. I appreciate it. And Mr. Brooks, we're having a really hard, at least I'm having a really hard time uh, hearing you. We're going to see if we can't turn you up just a little bit. Is it coming out of the speakers of that computer? Oh, it's coming out of the TV. Is it coming out of the speakers now? Well, Ben, we're going to we'll try to. Can you hear us fine? I'm sorry, what'd you say, Brian? <laughs> Yeah, Will you tell us who he is? Yeah, yeah, I'll do this. Ben, and I'm going to introduce you uh, so that the board member can hear. Uh, his name is Bennett Brooks. He's an acoustical consultant uh, with uh, Brooks Acoustic. Corporation. And and Ben, and I'm not going to testify for you, but I'm going to let you testify. Can you tell the board a little bit about your training and education? And we'll all be quiet. Uh, yes. Can you hear me, everybody? OK. Uh, well, thank you again for having me here by Zoom. Uh, uh, my name is Bennett Brooks. I'm the president of Brooks Acoustics Corporation. Uh, we're acoustical consultants uh, with offices in Pompano Beach, Florida, and Vernon, Connecticut. And uh, I was asked by uh, your applicant, Haley Hirsch, to conduct a study uh, for this uh, for this project. Uh, we have been uh, working on projects like this, well, myself, for over 40 years. Uh, 
have a bachelor degree in uh, mechanical engineering and a master's degree in acoustics. And uh, we've been designing uh, uh, projects uh, such as this for a long time. Um, in particular, uh, dog care facilities. Uh, uh, my involvement in those goes back to about 91 or 92. And uh, so we've worked on a bunch of them. And uh, uh, so I've had quite a lot of experience in this field. Uh, and it's been interesting to see the development of the field uh, go from uh, what you might think of as a, a basic kennel to uh, uh, today's facility, which is uh, quite advanced compared to the uh, older facilities in a lot of you know a lot of ways, uh, and particularly uh, in the uh, the treatment of the acoustics of the building. So uh, I'm happy to talk to you tonight about it. Yeah, and and Bennett, thank you. I think everybody could hear you on that. In preparation for today's hearing, uh, did you prepare an affidavit uh, which contains not only your CV but an acoustical report uh, that you prepared uh, for this proposed uh, use? Yes, I did. All right, and again, that's behind exhibit five. We'll mark that as um, exhibit five. Bennett, you uh, sent over your affidavit and it, and it doesn't look like it had a notary attestation, um, but you have seen your affidavit, you sent it over. Does that fairly and, and accurately represent uh, your opinions and the survey, the study that you performed? Yes, it does. And do you attest that's your signature on the on the second page of your affidavit? Yes. And if you can just tell the board uh, a little bit, I've included your study as an attachment to your exhibit. If you can just tell the board a little bit about what you did uh, and what you found out as this use would relate to the increase in noise in the surrounding neighborhood. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Brian. Uh, this study was conducted uh, with the um, objective of determining uh, how this facility might uh, be in compliance with the requirements of the town of Woodfin. And uh, I guess it's the conditional use permit that we're talking about. Um, so uh, that was the, the purpose of the study to see if the facility, the way it is designed, uh, would meet those requirements. So um, as part of the study, uh, we conducted background sound measurements in the area at a number of locations on the site. Uh, one location was a long-term continuous sound testing uh, uh, survey. Which, uh, which was, you can see in the pictures that if you, if you uh, have the report, I don't know if everybody has the report in front of them, but uh, there are some pictures uh, after the text part of the report that show uh, the sound monitoring. And you can see that we installed a sound monitor on a tree in the property. It was about 12 and a half feet up to prevent any tamp we didn't we didn't have any tampering but uh that's just as a precaution so we, we and it, there's several views in the pictures of what that looks like you can see it's a weatherproof box it's locked up uh, it's got a microphone that extends on a boom out from the box that's away from the tree and any leaves anything like that and uh, that measures the sound continuously it takes a sample every second and then we collate all that data uh, into uh, um, a graphical presentation. And uh, similarly, you can see on some of the other pictures uh, of the sound study, um, background sound study that uh, went out there on uh, three different occasions and tested on the site near the, uh, near the west side of the site, <coughs> excuse me, near the west side of the site, which is uh, adjacent to uh, Weaverville Road, also known as uh, US Highway 19 Business. 
And uh, so um, we tested the background sound levels over there on a number of occasions. And it's a similar type of data processing where we, we take a sample of all the acoustical parameters once a second, and then we can collate that into a, a graph that, that will show you what's going on in there. So, um, and, and Bennett, if I can just interrupt real briefly, just a, a procedural matter, Madam, Madam Chairperson, I don't know that Mr. Brooks was sworn in. Oh, you're right. Yeah, I think, I think we swore in everybody here, but he was not sworn in. So, so Bennett, I'm going to ask that, that you allow Madam Chairperson to swear you in. Are you ready? <laughs> okay. Hang on. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the evidence you shall give to the board in this action shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guys. Yes, I do. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. And, and so the, the testimony that you were previously talking to the board about, is that all uh, truthful to the best of your knowledge? Yes, it is. Okay. And, and if you could just tell the board, what, what's the reason that you were taking these background noise samples, as you just discussed? Well, thank you for the question. The reason for the background noise samples is to establish what the uh, existing character of the neighborhood is, uh, because that's important when assessing whether the uh, proposed facility will uh, fit in with the neighborhood in terms of uh, in terms of its sound character. And and is that described as is that typically called the ambient background noise? Yes, that's correct. And what did you find was the uh, ambient background noise in and around this area based on your study? Well, the uh, ambient background, we'll call it ambient background sound, was, yeah. uh, was primarily uh, dominated by the uh, road traffic <clears throat> yeah, from the interstate and also from uh, Weaverville Road. And did, did I, I guess I didn't hear you. Did you come up, you tell the board a little bit about how sound is measured and, and what the decibels are uh, and what decibel sound you found out there for ambient sound? Okay, uh, that's a that's good question. Uh, uh, the ambient sound is measured by the um, sound level uh, analyzer that we had both in the tree and the long term, which was which was installed up there for about four days. And that just continually chugged away, measuring the sound happily and putting all the data onto a, uh, onto a camera chip. And then similarly, we had another sound analyzer on a tripod and we moved that to a, several different locations and, and the microphone picks up whatever sound is happening in the area at that moment and translates it into a bunch of numbers, which it puts into the uh, computer chip. And uh, also both of the uh, monitors record the sound. So you can go back and listen to it later if you, if you so desire. So that's how it's measured. And then once we've got all that data off the computer chip, then that is uh, then, uh, analyzed in the computer using typical data analysis, like on a, an Excel spreadsheet. And we can see all of that data uh, one second at a time for four days if we want to. So, so what we did was we took that data and we, in, for the long-term uh, monitor, we grouped it together by the hour. So you wouldn't see a, a whole bunch of squiggly lines for four days, but it's grouped together uh, every hour, 24 hours a day for the four days. And then you can see the, um, the trends that go on from day to nighttime, for example. And, uh, and similarly, uh, we took the data from the short-term monitors and we did plot them out by the second because they were about 15 minutes long. Each, each record was 15 minutes long. So it wouldn't get too busy on the chart and uh, you could see what was going on. So, um, and, and once you, once you did that, Mr. Mr. Brooks, uh, were you able to determine what the ambient background sound was for that area? Yes. 
the ambient background sound is is fairly active we would say just because of the uh the traffic that's going on and um and so we would say that you know during the daytime you had uh levels that were uh in the uh area of oh uh 50 60 70 even up to 80 decibels at at moments and um you know that depends on uh, the traffic, if there's a truck going by or something like that. Now, now 60 to 70 decibels for a reference is similar to a conversation, a normal conversation you might have with somebody standing, say, at your six foot uh, separation distance. So if you're talking with somebody, you know, five or six feet away, uh, you, you'd probably be hearing about 60 to 70 decibels, depending on how loud they were talking. If they had a quieter voice, it'd be about 60. If they had a louder voice, it could be 70 or more. And then uh, if you get down into the uh, 50 range, oh, that might be equivalent maybe to uh, the refrigerator in your kitchen, something like that. And then down 40 or below is kind of a whisper. And, and it'd be hard. And, I don't know if you can hear me whispering, but but a 40 is about a whisper. And then, you know, 90 would be a loud truck. So that's kind of the range we're talking about. And the, the computer analysis that you do, is that something that uh, individuals in your field, including you, typically rely upon when calculating the decibel levels, the ambient sound levels? Yes, sir, it is. And were you able then to thereafter uh, determine any noise that may be generated from the use of this facility as a dog lodging and what effect it may may have on adjoining property? Yes, we did. We did that. And if you can tell the board about that. Yes. Well, it might be useful. Uh, I don't know if everybody can kind of scroll through the, the report. Uh, I guess on my copy, it's uh, page 21. So it's uh, after the the pictures maybe let's just if we went down and maybe looked at the site uh picture does everybody have a picture of the proposed site that would be called figure 2a it's right after the photographs um that shows that shows the site on weaverville road so oh uh, you can see uh a little bit to the north is the uh, Samaritan Ministry. A little bit to the mm -hmm. south is the uh, uh, Pine Burr Baptist Church. And, uh, and uh, a little bit to the west is the uh, Interstate Highway 26, also known as US uh, 19. And uh, if I ask you to flip back about a page or so, you'll see a picture of some dogs in what would be considered a kind of an old style um, mm -hmm. kennel. And uh, if everybody's got those pictures, that is the, the sound test that we relied upon to uh, conduct the prediction or estimate of what the sound level would be from the proposed facility. So you can see that there's from the pictures, there's there's different sized dogs, some small ones and, and some large ones. There's a sound analyzer out there. And uh, what we had to do was we had 14 dogs out there. They're in basically chain link uh, uh, crates or um, separation areas. And uh, we had to induce them to bark. So we walked back and forth with dog biscuits and we had another dog walking back there to try to get the dogs to bark uh, so that we could measure the sound level of these dogs. This was, this was a few years ago, and this is, this is our data. In fact, this data is relied upon uh, throughout the industry because I've published this data among, among uh, our industry. So, um, but the, the key thing to remember about these dogs in the picture here is that, um, it's really hard to get the dogs to bark for a couple of minutes uh, because after a while they they kind of start ignoring you and uh, they're they're quiet. So 
So in order to get the test data, we had to keep bargain for about three minutes and, and that was not easy. Uh, they, they lost interest after, after a short period of time. But um, anyway, we got the sound data and uh, we uh, then uh, if you scroll through or if it's on your computer, or if you have printed pages, a couple of pages down, you see the proposed site and then you see the next picture shows you where on the site we did the tests and it's a little closer up so you can see the, um, the church to the south and the ministry building to the north. And then the next picture uh, you'll see uh, where the civil engineer uh, did a, um, a drawing that highlights the residences that are uh, nearest to this proposed facility, to this, this site. Uh, to the north, which one is on Weaverville Road, it, its address is Weaverville Road, and then the uh, one to the south is on Old Home Road. So those were the two locations where we did the, the prediction calculation to determine what the uh, sound level would be at those homes. And, we'll, and, and based upon your analysis of the, the dogs in the cages uh, that you got to bark, and the distance of these residential homes from the proposed use, uh, what did you determine to be the effect, if any, uh, that those houses or that the use would have on those houses? Well, the, the bottom line is that uh, there would be little or no impact uh, on those houses from dog barking sounds that would occur at the proposed facility. And uh, the way you can see that is if you flip over to the next page, you'll see a graph of the ambient background sounds. And those are compared to the uh, barking dog sounds. So I don't know if everybody has that. It's kind of a time chart. Uh, mm -hmm. Does everybody have that? It's got a red graph on top and a kind of a green line on the bottom and, and some dots down there. People see that? Mm -hmm. uh, if you do, it starts, uh, I can walk you through it. So that'll explain everything. It's, um, it started on July 7th of a few months ago here uh, at uh, 7.15 in the evening. And so you can see on the left-hand, bottom left-hand side, you'll see 7.7 7 and 19.15. So that's, uh, that means it was uh, 7.15 p.m. And that continues, that was on a Wednesday, and then it continues over to uh, a, a Sunday, just afternoon, 1215. So the, this uh, meter was started at 15 after the hour. And uh, so uh, each hour it logged all this data. And uh, I can walk you through that. What you see is, let's start with the bottom green line. That is what's called the baseline level. And that's the level that's exceeded uh, during that hour, uh, one hour period, 90% uh, uh, of the time. So uh, that means that, uh, let's see, if an hour is 60 minutes, so uh, 54 minutes out of the 60 minutes, uh, it's, it's over that line. And so that's considered as an industry standard to be the background level. And uh, you can see that it, it gets lower in the middle of the night uh, down to uh, uh, below 40. And then during the daytime hours, it's about 55 or more. And uh, so that says that most of the time during those daytime hours, that sound level is over 55 A weighted decibels, which means that's a decibel that's kind of tailored to human hearing. So that's what we, that's what we all can hear. And so, 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 so if, if you look at that and then you look at the lines that are above it, those will give you various metrics that we have, like the, uh, the uh, dark blue one is the average level. So you can see that things fluctuate up and down. It'll, it'll be at around that level, but that's the average. And then the red one is the peak. So if there's a bunch of heavy trucks going by or something like that, they'll cause that line to go up the red line. The thing to compare it to is, okay, 
what we did was we took the sound level of three dogs outside that would be in the play area. And uh, let's say you had three dogs that just decided to bark simultaneously. Uh, that would be a very rare event. And let, uh, Brian, if I may, let me, let me go back and just say why that's a, a rare event. Yeah, that, that's fine. If okay. you can do that briefly. Yep. Uh, if you look in the report, you'll see that the whole uh, focus of this design is based on three pillars, uh, which we call the sound management program. Uh, the first pillar is the building design envelope. We have a very robust building design, which Joey uh, described to you a little bit earlier with uh, some thick walls and sound material in there to keep whatever sound is inside the building to remain inside the building so it won't get out. Uh, so that's the first pillar. The second pillar is the, the uh, features that we have outside the building to contain sound, including the uh, Ashland privacy fence. Uh, we've got uh, distance, which is a, a, a big factor to the homes. The distance is important. We also have a secondary fence, which, which is a security fence. And then we have in some locations of uh, covering many of the uh, play areas, we have that uh, retaining those retaining walls, which uh, which were described earlier. So so there's outside features to contain any sound for the from the dogs outside, and then the last part of it, it may be the most important, is kind of what uh, Miss Haley was talking about earlier, which was the uh, dog behavior management uh, system that uh, they have developed which would uh, give a lot of attention to the dog. So if one dog should start barking, what that means is the dog needs something. And uh, they have trained uh, attendants who will go uh, check on the dog and find out what they need. And one of the first things they're gonna do is bring the dog inside so they can assess the dog's situation. So um, that's the bit, you know, that's the short, uh, description of the behavior management program, but that's very important because if a dog does bark, that doesn't mean the dog is left outside. That dog goes inside and it's not going to disturb the other dogs. But as a precaution in our calculation, we said, okay, what happens if not just one dog, but three dogs bark simultaneously? And again, the way a dog barks is the way people talk. They don't all do it exactly at the same time. So it's not like you can really add up the sound from each one. They're individual events. But nevertheless, we, we took the worst case scenario uh, that we could find, which was three dogs barking at once. And when we plot that on the, on the chart against all the sound level that is already happening in the area, those are kind of the dark blue uh, purplish dots that are down on that chart. And that would be at the nearest uh, house, which is to the north on Weaverville at a distance of about 212 feet. And what you're seeing is 39 decibels. Uh, so that would be three dogs barking at the nearest house, 39 decibels. And that is equivalent to a quiet whisper, which if I was there with you, I'd, I'd whisper to you and you would know what that sounds like, but uh, I think you know anyway. But on, on Zoom, I don't know if you'll even hear it, but, but it's a whisper. So, Mr. Brooks, just, just to clarify a little bit of your testimony, uh, the sound generated by the three dogs uh, barking at the facility, uh, is that, would that uh, be below the ambient background sound that already exists? Yes, Brian, it's, it's way below the ambient background sound because you'll see that those dots go from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., which is the only time that the dogs will be allowed outside at all. So during that period of time, when three dogs at its worst case is 39 dB, 
the actual background sound in that area is well over 50. So that means that you're a good 15 decibels or more below the background sound, which and is a so lot. Based on based on your study and the and the uh, information you're just telling the board, is it your opinion, uh, or what is your opinion about the establishment's effect on the public health, safety, morals, comfort, welfare of people uh, working and residing in the neighborhood? <laughs> Well, my opinion on the uh, the the uh, welfare uh, of the and and uh, and uh, my lifestyle of the people living in the neighborhood uh, would be that this facility, in terms of its sound production, would be completely compatible with the neighborhood uh, because chances are uh, people would not even know it was there. Uh, considering any dog barking. Now, does that say that they'll never ever hear a dog? I mean, there could be a real quiet moment uh, that would be extremely rare where you could hear a dog, but um, based on my survey of the area and I had heard some dogs barking in the area, uh, if someone who lives around there hears a dog barking, it's probably gonna be uh, one of their, you know, from their neighbors rather than this facility, because this facility has that contained. So yes, uh, my opinion is that this facility will be completely compatible with the neighborhood. And, and will it, does your opinion, or in your opinion, will it be detrimental to the morals or comfort of the individuals working and residing in that neighborhood? No, this facility will not be detrimental to the morals or comfort to the people residing in the neighborhood. And in, and in your opinion, will it be injurious to the use and enjoyment uh, of people using their property in and around the neighborhood? <laughs> no, uh, this facility will not be injurious to the people uh, uh, enjoying the, their property in the neighborhood. Mr. Brooks, thank you. Those would be my questions, unless you have anything else you wanna add or the board may have some questions for you. Well, thank you, Brian. I'm uh, happy to answer any questions that the board may have. It doesn't look like there's any questions, Bennett. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank yes, you. We appreciate you. Uh, our last witness would be Don Reed. Good evening. My name is Don Reed, um, Carolina State Certified Residential Appraiser, Commercial Certified General, and I have an MAI designation from the Appraisal Institute. I've been doing uh, real estate appraisal since 2000 in Western North Carolina. There's um, a whole variety of stuff commercial, residential, investing, wetland mitigation to conservation, commercial buildings, apartment complexes. You also uh, have you also conducted an informed impact study? Yes. And tell the board what an impact study is. On an, on an impact study is actually sort of a, a, a single component of an appraisal process. Because in every appraisal, what you're doing is you're looking to find something different in a property that's not in another property. So if you have like a big design, you've got like a four car garage, and somebody has a three car garage, you look for houses that have that figure out what that difference is in the price of that or price. So in this case, I took houses because noise and sound impact property values, look for other boarding facilities, daycare and overnight boarding, what's in the neighborhood, what's nearby. And then you look at those houses that are near there that have sold, and then you find the best matches for those homes for quality and features, with the only difference being this is near a kennel, in this one's back in a quieter location. Um, yeah, well, in, in preparation for today's hearing, did you, for, uh, did you, did you um, uh, prepare an affidavit which includes not only your CV, but an impact study that you did for Ms. Hirsch? Yes. All right, and I'm just, and you had yours notarized. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Uh, is that fairly and accurately represent a copy of your affidavit? And your CV yeah. and the phone. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, and if you can tell the board just a little bit about what you did in, in preparing your CV, it's right behind tab six in the notebook, the exhibit notebook that I made. In, in preparing it. <laughs> So you, yeah, you just put, you look for the neighborhood first thing is go to the site location. Where is it? What's it like? We've heard a lot about that already tonight. We already know what's next door. It, it's a mix of commercial, residential. Um, you have Interstate 26. You have Weaverville Highway Road. Um, and so, what's the sound level? We heard Mr. Bennett talk about that because that's that's a critical component. Um, when you're you're near commercial uses. That impacts property values. So, in going through that, I don't know if you guys want to follow through. Um, the first part of my impact study is, is the basics about the property, which has already been gone into real detail. The site plans. Notice when I look at the community shopping zoning that it's in, and it does join residential, but that R21 residential. All of the uses in there, except for the one neighbor that wrote the letter supporting it, those are all commercial institutional uses, even though it is zoned residential. So, you know, as an appraiser, you know, what, what is, what's there, what's being used, and what's the future plan? Um, and then we go over, just get into the sales part of it, because we talk, they've talked about traffic um, with the noise, sound study already. Um, NCDOT is showing about 9,500, 8,500 cars a day. When you go down right by the property, is 8,500. Uh, Weaverville Highway came in at a, <laughs> I think 3,800, something like that. So there's, yeah, there's quite a bit, and then about 60,000 cars a day on uh, Interstate 26. And that's the those like uh, Mr. Bennett said are the noise generators. So then we get into and that's critical because where he, he talks about ambient noise, that's what's there all the time. And then is this going to add or take away what's going to be there? And since it's significantly lower, I consider that not to really be um, much of an impact. You go into mine, I show the Appalachian Animal Hospital, which is Interstate 26, Monticello Road, just the north side of Weaverville. There, it's an animal hospital, but they also do dog daycare and dog boarding. They've got just like a fenced chain link backyard. So I went close to the end, it's near Interstate 26. So you've got some of the traffic, same features as the neighborhood. And the, the near homes that sold, we're looking at Four fifty to five hundred fifty thousand dollars. So I consider those kind of similar to the homes up on the hill, getting up Serenity Mountain and everything. And so the difference, the distance from this facility to the water tower on GIS is about twelve hundred feet. This half the houses that sold on Songbird Lane, which is west of there, GIS shows to be about seven hundred ninety feet. One of them's a little less. One of them, yeah, still seven ninety four, and then. The one I analyzed 12 Songbird Lane is 815. And of those two sales, 25 Songbirds sold like last October. The market, as we all know with COVID, is really pretty volatile. So one of the most critical features I was looking for is things that sold at the very same time. And so when I took 12 Songbird, which sold in June of 2020, all and these Sales, Indian Trail, Forest Ridge, and 31 Valley Drive. 31 Valley Drive went under contract in March during lockdown, but then closed in May. But the other two sold in May. So under contract on the 7th. And then where's my contract date on the chart? If you want to go to that, that's where I did the adjustment grids, just like just like you do an appraisal going to the bank. Um, so under the contract date, the first one went under contract May the 7th, the next one May the 12th, and 12 Songbird was May the 20th. So it's all right there in that same time frame. So there wouldn't be any of this, what's happening in the market, how's the market changing? And then I matched them all up. All of these are actually a little bit larger home, so they should indicate even a higher value. But when you compare them and you comp them all out, 
they come down where 12 songbirds go to the top of the market at that point. So it's really, I didn't find any, any impact or damage from the Appalachian Animal Hospital and daycare facility on that side compared when you get to that distance. Now we didn't do sound measures until the sound goes away. <laughs> but that was a critical piece to put together from an analysis. So going through all of it, I don't see any any negative impact on it. You, you know, you've got automotive services and retail and a whole mix of stuff there. And I think it's a good location for it. So in so in your opinion, um, the proposed use, just to clarify, uh, will it be injurious or substantially diminish or impair? No. Okay. And, and in your opinion, um, will the use, the appeal and the function of, of the use cause substantial depreciation in property values within the neighborhood? No. And those are all based on the impact study, the analysis that you did in the, uh, the match pair analysis that's included in your report? Yes. Is there anything else you'd like to add for the board? No. Those would be my questions, Mr. Reed, unless the board has any additional questions. And Mr. Hart, just one, two quick questions for Adrian. Um, Adrian, I think you were The uses that are proposed uh, as a kennel and the single family residential use, they're allowed as a conditional use. And I don't know if you guys are calling it special use now or conditional use, but a conditional use under the community, the CF zoning. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, those would be my uh, those would be my questions for you. you know. Thanks, Adrian. <laughs> And that would be the presentation of the case for the apple. Okay. So, <clears throat> hearing no questions, okay, or presentation of the challenging facts, the board will now begin deliberating. Does the board have any more questions for the parties or witnesses? Before we move into deliberation, uh, board members are encouraged to reference the applicable. And there's been specific evidence in your deliberation. Okay, we're good. All right. We're going to discuss it. And is there a motion to approve? Do you want to show that? Are we moving right to that? Or do you want to do some discussion? I'll let my. I feel like on, on the project, is like, I think it, it's a good fit for the town of Woodson. Uh, I don't personally think it is going to affect uh, land value, property value in that area. Uh, I like the architectural style of it. I like it's kind of where you're going with it. My one concern, not, and it's probably not even a concern, but business wise, I'm just thinking in the goal. I know we all love dogs and we all love. Hopefully that's going to be our, our thing, but is the plan to attach the, the single family residence to the, the property for its entirety, or is that going to be its own sectioned off parcel of land that potentially could be sold one day to somebody else? Um, the plan is, is uh, I'll be there and um, <laughs> vote on the plan. I mean, I know that's a crystal ball yeah, kind of question. Um, my plan would probably be to do but it would always take part of the Was around noise and uh, hard to refute the evidence that they've been. Okay. I don't know how they're going to teach the dogs to use those toilets outside. <laughs> 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 
in the first minute, and I had to do it again. I did a double take. <laughs> yeah. uh, right. uh, so the, the play areas are those indoor outdoor spaces? Yeah. And is there shade over the turf grass? But I, the only reason I ask is I'm thinking about doing this in my house and looking good in the residential sense. And that's the one thing the guy was was talking to me about was the main difference with that in real grass, the canine specific is just when the direct sunlight hits it, not shaded light, but direct sunlight, that that gets unbearable sometimes. So, um, with experience having to do some of the pilot, uh, I'm like really big when I have like 100 degrees, but it's hotter there. Yeah. It's usually only allowed to go out for a short amount of time with something inside. Now, the design of my building is indoor, kind of garage doors yeah. that they can go in and out. So, um, actually, at the conference, the two conferences I was just at, um, I realized that you can sprinkler yeah. the canine grass. Yeah. And you can administer with the sprinklers with some of the disinfectants that sit on there, and then it's much easier. So, that is my change, and I've already spoken <laughs> to um, the uh, mechanical engineer to uh, put, incorporate that. <laughs> Okay. I think that's pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a good product. Okay. Anything else? Anything else you guys want to If you can mm -hmm. reference in your motion that they meet the general conditional use requirements and the um, specific group development conditional use requirements. Does anyone want to do that? Or want me to read? Sure. <laughs> well, you can read them all. You can say that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 